Well, Todd, welcome back to Super Chat. Thanks, Gary. Great to hear from you again. Yes, and it's always a pleasure. I enjoy our conversations. But the first thing I wanted to talk to you right out of the gate isn't exactly fun to talk about. It's just not fun, period. Because I don't have to tell you or our listeners that nasty weather can just happen quickly around the school district this time of year. But it does present some unique challenges for a person in your position. And let's drill it down to the parental level where they have to arrange for sitters and a whole whole litany of things. Can you describe for me and our listeners what they should know about closures and delays? Yeah, I, I, the most important thing here is to let the parents know that we do seriously take in consideration what delaying a school early releasing for a school or canceling a school day causes for parents. We are aware they are working parents. We do realize that if they have to stay home and provide daycare themselves, they are losing out on money. So we take this very, very serious. There's different circumstances on days when it's snowing. To let folks know, we start our day at about 3 a.m. We get out, we drive the roads, we call around, see what's going on. We have some different areas of the district. When you have as many square miles as we do for the Northwest Local School District, you have a lot of areas that are hilly, a lot of areas that don't get treated as well as some of the neighborhoods. The last couple of weeks, we've had to deal with not only snow, but the temperature. And and this is a very difficult one that people get very frustrated and upset with. We know that looking at anything below zero, wind chill or regular temperature, has the ability to cause frostbite or issues for people who are out in the weather for 20 minutes or longer. To remind everyone, we do not have high school transportation, so all of our kids at the high school, if they don't catch a ride, they walk. This could be anywhere from a half mile to a three mile jaunt for them to walk in the weather, depending on what they have to do. We also have kids standing out at bus routes and waiting at their bus stops, but you don't know what an accident could slow a bus down. You don't know what the weather could do. So we will use a negative temperature below zero as something that will cause us to delay. We will go with the two hour delay. If, For example, one school starts at eight and by 10 o'clock it's above zero. But if it's not going to be above zero at 10 o'clock, then we sometimes cancel school. And it's been some really harsh wind chill and temperatures around here. So It's mainly getting parents to understand that we don't just make decisions. We contact other school districts. We are in constant contact with them to see what their thoughts and beliefs are. Our main contacts are our surrounding school districts. It's Roth, Southwest Ohio, Oak Hills, North College Hill, Three Rivers. It's our neighboring schools, Mount Healthy. What are they doing? What are your thoughts And we make sure we check all forecasts. But again, we're just like the weathermen trying to predict it. Sometimes we hit it right. Sometimes we miss. I think the calls we've made this year have been spot on. But that doesn't mean tomorrow we have another situation where it's supposed to start icing around 10 a.m. and snow around 12 or 1. So the problem with that is for us to do an early release, if kids' parents can't get at home because they're stuck in traffic or at work, we have to bring the kids back to school. And then the parents have to come pick them up. Well, that causes more problems because then the parents are driving through the snow themselves. So we'll be making more decisions tonight. We try to get it out as early as possible to assist parents with their daycare. And I cannot stress how important it is and and what we look at. We do understand what parents are going through. It's very difficult to get daycare. We do understand if they stay home, they don't get paid. So we take all that serious. But again, the bottom line is what's the best safety for our kids? I understand. It is pretty universal. I talk to many, many, many schools. And uh, that bottom line, at the end of that line of decision making, it's about safety for students, staff, and everybody involved. But you're absolutely right. And I don't envy sitting in your seat looking at bad weather because you just don't know. Uh, The weathermen don't know. I mean, what the heck? I mean, let's be honest here. Well, I wanted to shift uh, gears here on you. I was wondering if you could remind our listeners what redistricting really means if they are not aware of that already, and how does it affect your schools? This is going to be a very 
important piece of information that we will communicate out to our district. Um, because when you change boundary lines for what school you attend, it does affect kids, it does affect parents, and it can call, sometimes cause a lot of anxiety. So as everybody knows, we're building the three new elementary schools going from five. The goal is to have the three new elementary schools have a population of anywhere from 880 students to 925 students because that's what they were built for. The last thing we want is empty classrooms. With that being said, we have the opportunity to move some Coleraine Elementary students, who is our largest elementary in the district currently sitting at 958. Reality is it should be nowhere near 900, but because of boundary lines and everything else, it is large. What we're looking is doing a complete overhaul of parts of Coleraine L, not all of it. So we're looking at removing 350 students and placing them in our new elementary schools. So the first thing people will ask, oh, you're changing my boundaries. Now does that change my high school? Well, two things. This redistricting will not change the middle school they attend. And it will not change the high school they attend. In no way does it affect the middle school or high school. Whatever they would have attended where they are today, they will attend the same next year. It just changes the elementary boundaries. This is important because as we've been going through this building process, we have been working closely with OFCC. OFCC has no control over what we pick and choose for our buildings, none whatsoever. But by partnering with them, they will give us credits for things that we put in our new schools that meet their guidelines also. Those credits are adding up right now to $17 million. So originally, when we started this planning three years ago, we just went by, we had 900 students at Coleraine L, 600 at Coleraine Middle. So we needed a 1,500 student K-8 through campus. We no longer need that. We have the ability to move 350 out of Coleraine, put it at 600, Coleraine Middle. So now we're up to a 1,200 person K-8 through campus. So what we thought was going to cost us 35 to 40 million to build is now going to be closer to 28 to 32. So a huge savings there. So there's no reason not to have these state-of-the-art schools with everything kids can imagine and not let other kids attend these schools. So that is the purpose of redistricting. Yes, it will reduce the amount of teachers needed in Coleraine L, and they will have jobs and they will be placed in the new schools or wherever we see the need. The biggest thing is what are the certification of some of these staff? So I know the principals have talked to the Coleraine L staff and the Montford Heights staff about the possibilities of move because of decreasing enrollment at both buildings. And these are things we have to look at because it is our responsibility to stay fiscally responsible to our community. It makes no sense to have 350 kids in an older building without state-of-the-art technology, window air conditionings, which we put in at Coronel, and not place them in a new school. So we will make sure that when we move, we have equal representation of veteran teachers and new teachers as required by the Ohio Department of Education. And we will also make sure that the student make of a beach school is equal in terms of students with disabilities, economically disadvantaged, and all of the different races that make up our school. So this is big, but I don't want people to panic. Our plan is to finalize what the boundaries will look like. Then we will set up meetings, mail letter homes to all parents, telling them when the meeting is so we can present what we've put together and then ask for their feedback and input and see if any changes need to be made. So this is very important. We do want community involvement, but it is something that is necessary in order to save money for the district. Good explanation. Todd, I wanted to change directions again on you here. And this is a subject that we encounter from time to time. But I'd like you to speak to the survey uh, related to students wearing uniforms at Northwest High School and Pleasant Run Middle. What can you report on this? I'm hoping folks who live on the other side of the district or, or in our schools who don't have uniforms get a little bit of background here. Originally, this started about uh, anywhere from eight to 10 years ago because of issues in Northwest High School. And the PTA came to the building principal who then worked with central office and a uniform policy was put in place. The uniform policy was then adopted by Pleasant Run Middle School. Well, now we have a parent group because parents are who helped get it incorporated into our schools. And now parents have concerns about it being only in two schools and not the other 11 that make up our district. 
some views have seen the uniforms as being racist. It is only the north side of the district that has them. Why doesn't the south side of the district have them? So there are some big concerns that the uniforms are in place for reasons that are no longer necessary. So a survey was sent out by Northwest High School and Pleasant Run Middle School to get parent and student feedback. We had a great response, 1,233 responses, answered some questions for us, gave written feedback in the, the survey. And now the buildings are going to look at the survey, look at the results, form committees, and come up with a dress code that we hope could be something that we use district-wide. There is a lot that was liked about the uniform. Um, what it helped on the north side of the district is it brought school spirit back into the buildings. Kids wearing Northwest and Pleasant Run shirts, um, wearing school colors. But they also have issues that were addressed about hoodies, addressed about how many buttons are allowed on shirts, what colors. And then it also goes down and affects economically disadvantaged. Uh, when they originally went to it, Parents were very happy because we didn't have to keep up with the Joneses and buy the, the name brand stuff that everybody looked the same. So we weren't competing. And that does affect kids. And that's the least thing we want to do. So we will look at this very closely. But I don't want anybody to be blindsided about a new dress code that we're discussing. Not a uniform anymore, but a dress code and what we will do with that so we can hopefully get something that is K through 12 for the entire district and not just two schools in our district. You know, I wanted to uh, ask you about a final topic here. A while back, we uh, discussed a little bit about a uh, diversity committee, and the diversity committee had a meeting, and what progress has been made involving this initiative? All right, so after our board presentation, we have now established a committee that will start working on a diversity committee plan, and it'll be a diversity plan for the entire district. So tonight is our first meeting from 6 to 7.30 at Houston um, early Learning Center, but this is one of several meetings. So if there is someone out there who we're going to spread this podcast around as many places as we can, if this is something that you have a passion for, and we want to make sure that we have a great representation of diversity on this committee, our African-American parents, our white parents, our um, ESL parents, we can provide interpretation for meetings. We don't want to exclude anyone is what I'm saying. If language is a barrier for parents and kids can help translate, we will put in place whatever we can because we truly need a diversity plan that is representative of the makeup of our entire district. So the meetings start tonight. There are several other meetings. Uh, the biggest thing is all folks have to do is email me or call me, and I will gladly get the information on the meeting. So I appreciate you bringing that up. Yes, fair enough. Well, Todd, another good report and a nice balance of topics again this month. Uh, I appreciate you openly sharing this information with your stakeholders, and I want to thank you for coming on the show and joining me today here on Super Chat. I appreciate it, Gary. Thanks for the opportunity. 